Hello, and welcome back to Skidmore's webinar series. My name is Caressa Miles, Associate Director of Alumni Relations and College Events, and I'll be your host for this final session of 2022. We're delighted that you chose to spend some time with us today. Before we dive in, I'd like to mention that there will be an opportunity for question and answer following the presentation. So please submit your questions via the Ask a Question button if you're viewing from our Alumni Learning Consortium landing page. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share it with all of you via email in the next few days. And now it's my pleasure to present Sheldon Solomon, Professor of Psychology here at Skidmore College. His studies of the effects of the uniquely human awareness of death on behavior are supported by the National Science Foundation and Ernest Becker Foundation and featured in the documentary film, Flight from Death, The Quest for Immor Immortality. Today's talk was an immensely popular lecture during our Celebration Weekend mini college series this year, and we knew we had to bring it to the big screen. So without further ado, Sheldon, thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Carissa. And uh, thank you, everybody uh, out there in the ethereal mist. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to even virtually uh, be able to engage uh, with everybody, people of yesteryear, folks that uh, may be currently uh, enrolled. Uh, I hope there'll be an opportunity in the not too distant future for all of us to be able to be embodied uh, in the same physical location. But um, until that moment, I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to have some connection uh, with folks in the Skidmore community and to talk about uh, one of the only two things that I find myself preoccupied with these days, and that's got to be silly, but not fire and fascism. Uh, on the one hand, um, I have, I pointed out when I did this presentation at the mini college a few weeks ago, uh, that um, whether we like it or not, and some of you are very much aware of this, uh, the planet is melting and we are very much on the cusp of rendering it unfit for human habitation and only the willfully ignorant and intellectually dormant can deny uh, that uh, we need to do something pretty quickly uh, about that. Um, let's reserve that for uh, another time. It demoralizes me to even think about that. So let's talk about something um, relatively less daunting, but really not, and that's fascism. If we had more time, I would talk about the connection uh, between uh, climate change uh, and fascism, uh, because there are some recent folks who have observed uh, that those are intimately connected. But today, let's narrow our concerns and, and uh, let's talk about the psychological underpinnings uh, of fascism. And, and let's note that, as I said to the folks a few weeks ago, check your politics uh, at the door for the moment. This is not a political diatribe so much as an effort to understand uh, what's happening around us. Uh, I am now located on the third floor of the Tisch Learning Center, um, and that's in the history department. And I've been very much influenced by some of the great historians at the college, particularly Matt Hockenos, who has been uh, exchanging ideas with me uh, about the historical origin of fascism and totalitarianism. And he told me to read this summer or last summer, Hannah Arendt's book, The Origin of Totalitarianism. And, and I ran across a line in the book that I just found arresting. And that's when Arendt says, the result of a consistent and total substitution of lies for factual truth is not that the lie will now be accepted as truth and truth be defamed as a lie, but that the sense by which we take our bearings in the real world and the category of truth versus falsehood is among the mental means to this end is being destroyed. And that's what I want to talk about. And that is basically what are the psychological processes and what are the underlying motives uh, that has created a situation that I hope that you can recognize that what Arant is saying is a 
pretty decent description of the world uh, that we now find ourselves in, that a lot of us are just kind of walking around uh, in a bit of a dissociated stupor because uh, of the routine uh, uh, just globbing together of truth and lies to the point where we're just uh, our capacity to discern the difference has essentially been destroyed. All right, well, let's start by just talking about what we mean when we use the term fascism or totalitarianism. Uh, and uh, old timers who were around when I got here in 1980 might remember that in my first semester, uh, we read Eric Fromm's book escape from freedom. And uh, I was shocked when I learned that Eric Fromm uh, came to the United States in order to flee Nazi Germany. Uh, and yet by the time he wrote the book Escape from Freedom, there's a chapter uh, about fascism in Germany. And then there's a chapter about the danger of fascism happening in America. And Fromm in the 1940s said that he thought we were more prone to becoming a fascist country uh, than we might have thought. And so he wrote, there is no greater mistake and no graver danger than not to see that in our own society, we're faced with the same phenomenon that is fertile soil for the rise of fascism anywhere. The insignificance and powerlessness of the individual. So let's just note that Fromm is making a psychological argument about a particular kind of psychological condition uh, and the allure of certain kinds of totalitarian leaders. Some of you from the old days may also remember that we read a book by Sinclair Lewis called It Can't Happen Here, uh, written in the 1930s, a crappy novel, uh, but quite insightful. Lewis describes in the United States, uh, remembering that Hitler was elected in Germany. Uh, this is set in the U.S. and basically uh, a mediocre, uh, an intellectually and morally challenged businessman uh, teams up uh, with right wing media, in this case, talk radio uh, and religious fundamentalists. Uh, and they essentially co-opt an election and then use democracy to end democracy. Uh, and America becomes a totalitarian state. All right now. Uh, Sinclair Lewis might have been 80 years or so off, uh, but I believe that what he was worried about at the time is what we're seeing materializing day to day uh, in front of our very eyes. And you can see on this slide different characteristics uh, that some people propose are early warning signs that we're about to enter into the world of fascism. Uh, let's be a little bit more precise, though, and let's note uh, that there's no one definition of fascism. And I like Adam Gopnik writing in The New Yorker pointing out that uh, there's different kinds uh, of fascism, uh, but uh, they all seem to include uh, some elements of populism, and that's kind of a divisive domestic environment uh, where we, the people, uh, are not everybody, but where a subset of the population declares themselves real Germans or real Americans, as opposed uh, to another subset of the population uh, that are declared to be not quite us. There's an element of nativism, and that's kind of where the best and fuck the rest that becomes manifested as virulent and malignant ethnocentrism and xenophobia. And then there is a mindless adherence and subservience, a morbid, uh, a, a morbid dependency uh, on a seemingly larger than life leader. And this is the notion of authoritarianism. More recently, Jason Stanley, a, a philosophy professor at Yale, uh, I like his book about the workings of fascism, where he says fascist politics aims to separate a population into an us and a them. Fascist politicians transform the population's shared understanding of reality by twisting the language of ideals through propaganda 
and promoting anti-intellectualism, attacking universities and educational systems that might challenge their ideas. Eventually, fascist politics create a state of unreality in which conspiracy theories and fake news uh, replace reason debate. Uh, and we'll get to this, but that might sound a, a tad familiar in terms of what we see happening in our country today. All right, here's a couple of fascists. This is Mussolini uh, on the left. Uh, and um, and uh, interestingly, a, a true statement. Fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it is a merger of state and corporate power. Uh, Mussolini was at least being honest here. So was Hitler when he said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, uh, it will be believed. Uh, and eventually, we're going to go from Hitler to former President Donald Trump. I call him Orange Hitler sometimes, to be, just to emphasize both the commonality and the difference between him and his predecessor. Uh, but note, um, the, I love the poorly educated, and you'll see there's a reason for that. And, and then the uber-fascist declaration. Just remember what you are seeing and what you are reading. It is not what's happening. All right, let's do it. And let's just note before we do uh, that uh, don't be thinking that fascism is something that might happen in America at some vaguely unspecified future moment. It is happening as I speak, and it is <laughs> happening at a rather alarming rate. Uh, and uh, on the left, when fascism comes to America, it will be wrapped in the flag and carrying a cross. Uh, that was a famous review uh, of the Sinclair Lewis book, It Can't Happen Here. And so I added to that review, it'll be wrapped in the flag, carrying a cross and toting a gun. Uh, and some of you may have seen this before. This is lovely. Merry Christmas, Santa, please bring ammo. Uh, the gentleman on the sitting on the bottom left, uh, that's Thomas Massey, uh, and uh, he's actually a congressional representative. So this is a guy who is in Congress in Kentucky. Uh, and to be silly, I, I, if we were live, I'd say, who's ever heard of this person? And most people haven't. And my joke is, oh, what you haven't, because this is a member of the moderate wing. Uh, of the Republican Party with a family with submachine guns begging Santa to bring ammo. All right, well, uh, let's figure this out. And again, my question is about the psychodynamic underpinnings uh, of fascism. Uh, more specifically, how do fascist leaders use lies uh, to advance their interest and render their followers incapable of distinguishing uh, between falsehoods and rational efforts to make accurate uh, depictions of reality. Uh, and the answer here is that uh, what they tend to do is, is to exploit, knowingly or not, uh, basic human cognitive proclivities. To put that another way, uh, it is actually easier to lie to people uh, than it is to convey truth and engage uh, in rational deliberation. And so I guess that's going to be uh, my big point with regard to how I address this question. Uh, and so, um, uh, so some of you, a lot of us, ha have done this before. Let's just start with uh, Charles Peirce, uh, fixation of beliefs for uh, LS1 people, human dilemmas people. Uh, remember that Peirce uh, just said he's a pragmatic philosopher. And, and he said, look, most of us think that our beliefs are generally reasonable and uh, typically true. Peirce disagrees, though. He says, look, most of our beliefs are neither reasonable nor true. And that's because we don't have beliefs in the first place in order to pursue that which is true. Rather, according to Peirce, and he happens to be right, at least in terms of empirical research, we have beliefs primarily because we do not like the unpleasant feeling that is engendered by doubt. 
All right. So basically what Peirce says is that whenever you're in a situation uh, where you're uncertain, uh, that's extraordinarily unpleasant. And then he says, quote, the irritation of doubt causes a struggle to attain a belief. Uh, and moreover, once we have a belief, that determines what we want and what we do, despite the fact that many, and for some people, most of our beliefs are patently false or have never been seriously questioned. All right, let's fast forward a century or so, and let's talk about uh, Daniel Kahneman, the first psychologist at Princeton, uh, first psychologist, he is at Princeton to win a Nobel Prize. He won it in economics. Uh, but um, important is his depiction of how the human mind works. Uh, and basically what Kahneman says is that our mind is divided into two systems. One he calls system one, fast thinking. Uh, and this is basically cognitive autopilot. And this is where we spend most of our waking moments, whether we're aware of it or not. We continuously scan the world around us. We react automatically and effortlessly, often via heuristic shortcuts, sometimes determined by authoritarian dictates. And this allows us to react quickly, uh, but often with lots of inaccuracies. On the other hand, what Kahneman points out is that we are perfectly capable of thinking rationally uh, and coming to true conclusions, but that's not our default mental state. That system to slow thinking uh, needs to be actively initiated. It takes effort, it takes attention, uh, it takes exercise, it takes self-control. In other words, it takes education. And, and while this is much slower and more effortful uh, than system one, uh, this gets us to more realistic and more accurate conclusions. I wish we had more time so that I could uh, delineate why system one and system two are both critical and ideally function in a coordinated fashion. Story for another time or read Kahneman's book. My point is that what fascists do is to cripple system two by lobotomizing their followers intellectually uh, and, uh, and, and basically mangling them uh, emotionally. So that's the point uh, that I would like to make in terms of my explanation for what's going on. All right, so how are we going to do that? Uh, let's talk about one of my favorite books that I believe everybody should be taking a peek at today, uh, and or someday soon, rather. And that's a book called The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements uh, by Eric Hoffer, self-educated longshoreman in San Francisco who after World War II, uh, he said, I got to figure out uh, what's going on. How, how did we have Hitler getting elected? How, how did we get Mussolini? Uh, how do we get uh, Stalin types? Uh, and uh, what Hoffer concluded is that the primary impetus for all populist or totalitarian or fascist movements is a critical mass uh, of disaffected citizens subject to grave insecurity in desperate need of something to live for. Remember Eric Fromm saying that uh, that's the one thing that characterizes uh, the allure uh, of fascism is psychological insecurity uh, that leads people to borrow from Thoreau, living lives of quiet, or in this case, not so quiet desperation. Hoffer goes on to say that such citizens are prone to unwavering dedication to certain kinds of leaders who confidently espouse a cause that infuses their lives with a sense of value and meaning. All right, Hoffer goes on and he says, look, these kind of leaders, they don't need to be smart. They don't need to be noble. They don't even need to be original. But read with me when he says, the primary qualifications, quote, seem to be audacity and a joy in defiance, an iron will, a fanatical conviction that he's in possession of the one and only truth, 
faith in his destiny and luck, a capacity for a passionate hatred, contempt for the present, a cunning estimate of human nature, a delight in symbols, the arrogant gesture, the complete disregard of the opinion of others, the single-handed defiance of the world, and some deliberate misrepresentation of facts. In other words, lying is central to fascism and populism. Mass movements, he claims, also require an external enemy uh, to enable the charismatic leader to deflect the rage and righteous indignation of their frustrated and disaffected followers. To put this another way, what fascists do uh, very well, uh, they're alchemists of hate. They take the fears of their followers and they transform them into rage and then they tell their people who to hate uh, by just identifying either in groups or out groups as all encompassing repositories of evil that must be eradicated in order to make life on earth as it is purported to be in heaven. So there's the emotional mangling. You're going to turn their fear into hate. And then finally, all active movements strive to interpose a fact proof screen between the faithful and the realities of the world. They do this by claiming that the ultimate and absolute truth is already embodied in their doctrine and that there's no truth nor certitude outside of it. It is the true believer's ability to shut his eyes and stop his ears to facts, which is the source of his unequaled fortitude and constancy. He cannot be frightened by danger, nor disheartened by obstacles, nor baffled by contradictions because he denies their existence. So there's the lobotomy. When you have somebody completely committed uh, to an ideological demagogue, a fact bounces off them uh, like rainwater cascading off a duck's ass in a hurricane. All right, well, let's see how this works, at least with regard to Hitler. A uh, thousand page book, definitely take a peek if you have a moment. This is a book by a German historian about Hitler in the early days. And I'm grabbing these quotes from a New York Times review uh, of the book, but let's just go through them. Hitler was often described as an egomaniac who only loved himself, a narcissist with a taste for self-dramatization and a, a fondness for superlatives. He was known for a bottomless mendacity magnified by a slick propaganda machine that used the latest technology to spread his message. Hitler was so thoroughly untruthful that he couldn't recognize the difference uh, between lies and truth. All right, read Mein Kampf if you've got a moment. Hitler knew exactly what he was doing. Here he writes about lies. In the big lie, there is always the force of credibility because the broad masses of a nation are always more easily corrupted in the deeper strata of their emotional nature than consciously or voluntarily. And thus, in the primitive simplicity of their minds, they more readily fall victims to the big lie rather than the small lies, since they themselves often tell small lies in little matters, but would be ashamed to resort to large-scale false. Hoods. All right, we'll skip a sentence and just go to the bottom. For the grossly imprudent lie always leaves traces behind it, even after it has been nailed down. A fact which is known to all expert liars in this world and to all who conspire together in the art of lying. All right, one more point or a couple of more points. Hitler was a great orator. Uh, he loved big rallies, which he said had to be at night to be sure that people weren't thinking too much. Uh, he was big on uh, nationalist, ethnic, anti-Semitic um, uh, diatribes. He peppered his speeches with coarse phrases and put downs. Even as he fermented chaos, he offered himself as a visionary leader who could restore law and order. He said that only he uh, could make Germany great again. A and he argued that if you're going to be effective, uh, you must appeal to emotions and avoid reason at all point, uh, at all, uh, at all costs. Uh, and he just said, you got to have the lowest mental common denominator. People are feeble. 
effective propaganda needed to be boiled down to a few slogans that could be persistently repeated until the very last individual has come to grasp the idea that has been put forward. All right, let's fast forward to the present. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be annoyingly provocative when I make uh, former President Trump, I'm going to call him Twitler, uh, and I'm going to point out that Twitler rhymes with Hitler. Uh, if we had more time, I would go back, or you can do this at home, write me if you want to see these slides. Uh, just do one of those um, replacement things. If you were to take out Hitler and replace everything that we just read with the word Trump, uh, I don't see any difference between the depiction of Hitler in his early days and, and Trump uh, to this day. Uh, he is capitalizing on the left, as Don DeLillo puts it, uh, the helplessness and the fear of his constituents. Uh, he is, uh, as Steve Bannon notes, uh, he is pure Hitler. Uh, we got elected on drain the swamp, lock her up, build a wall. This was pure anger. Anger and fear is what gets people to the polls. All right, well, let's keep going. And uh, let me just make this argument more crisp uh, and clear when I compare uh, uh, Trump to Hitler. Uh, I'm not saying there's going to be concentration camps or genocide yet. Uh, what I am saying are two things. One is, is that they're very similar in terms of their personality. Uh, and secondly, I, again, I don't mind annoying you. I think that Trump has, uh, he's going faster uh, than Hitler. Uh, in terms of undermining democracy in the United States, uh, even as I speak. All right, but uh, don't listen to me. Go out and read this book on the left, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. It's edited by Bandy Lee, who's a professor in the medical school at Yale, or at least she was till they fired her uh, for, um, for these ideas. Uh, but this is 27 different psychiatrists uh, arguing uh, the the following, that Trump is a malignantly narcissistic sociopath with psychotic tendencies. Um, he is moreover racist, xenophobic, homophobic, and misogynistic. And, and on top of that, he is perhaps the world's uh, greatest uh, liar. Uh, about 80% of everything that tumbles out of Trump's oral cavity uh, is factually incorrect. He knows only too well. Uh, how to use falsehood for base purposes. Uh, like Hitler, Trump uses a constant barrage of emotionally charged lies uh, to keep his followers enraged and engaged. You have to do everything you can uh, to prevent people from having uh, the attention or, or the motivation to actually think about things uh, I also like this book on the right, which is just came out by a, a, an interesting doctor uh, who points out that uh, Hitler and Trump, it'd be great if they were historical anomalies, but they're not. It turns out there's no shortage of hi historical examples of fucking crazy people, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, that end up becoming uh, totalitarian monsters. All right, well, what's the main difference? The way that I see it, uh, Trump is potentially more dangerous because he has the benefit of a slick propaganda machine that on top of everything that Hitler has uh, includes 21st century misinformation, disinformation, technology. Old timers might remember the Canadian media guy, uh, Marshall McLuhan. His famous phrase is the medium is the message. And, and what McLuhan pointed out is that every time there is new communication technology, uh, and, and he says, let's just read, uh, the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is, of any extension of ourselves, result from the new scale that's introduced into our affairs by such extension of ourselves or by any new technology. English translation, Twitter, Facebook, social media uh, has changed uh, the way uh, that information is circulated 
uh, in a fashion that makes us particularly prone to succumb uh, to the relatively evil inclinations of fascist demagogues. All right, so uh, uh, on top left, Donald Trump's Twitter tantrums do one thing quite well. I'm a little tired and meandering, but uh, I don't mind telling you that if Trump was on Twitter today with 80 million followers, I believe we would already uh, be in the middle of a civil war. I think it's only because he no longer has a direct connection to literally almost 100 million people that he lobotomizes by barrages of bullshit. I think we'd be in deeper trouble than we now are. Um, and and uh, top right, Steve Bannon, uh, again, uh, Maya Angelou, when somebody tells you who they are, believe them. The Democrats don't matter. The real opposition is the media, and the way to deal with them is to flood the zone with shit. All right. No, there's no pretense of rational discourse here. There's no pretense uh, of belief in certain policies. There's no pretense in the civil disagreement necessary for actual democracy. This is all about hate. This is all about fear. Uh, this is all about flooding the zone with shit. All right. Well, uh, the National Interest article says President Donald Trump has shown a unique ability to use Twitter as a way to connect directly with his followers. Next point, less well appreciated but apparent in our research is how Trump's anger and its targets are quickly adopted and internalized by large numbers of his followers. What he says, they say. What he believes, they believe. And this is really important. Karen Horn, I call this a morbid dependency. I'll call it anal cranial fusion, that what we've got uh, are, are psychologically needy people uh, groping uh, for a psychological life raft that they're finding uh, in the form uh, of former President Trump. And so here's one of the pictures that keeps me awake at night. I don't know how to point to stuff, uh, but uh, this scares me. It's all too white, all too smug, all too stupid, a top right, little future fascist girl. Uh, this is what I see uh, when I look either at Trump rallies or History Channel uh, Hitler pep rallies back in the day. All right, let's keep going, though. And let's note that Trump follows the Hitler playbook rather consistently. Accuse the other side of that, which you are, are guilty. My point, though, is that what studies show is that the emotional state of Trump supporters is correlated with the anger and hostility of his tweets. And so before he got bounced from Twitter, uh, uh, there was a great study that just measured how angry and hostile his supporters were, and, and they matched that against the degree of anger and hostility in his tweets, uh, and uh, what they found was a high positive correlation. When Trump is angry, his followers are angry. Uh, when Trump says, you're going to have to fight to the death in order to save our country, he means it literally. And his people take him quite seriously. Moreover, what the Facebook Twitter world allows the Trump types to do is to be responsible for a huge chunk of the misinformation that is circulating in the world around us. And so a study at Cornell uh, based on 15 or so, uh, 38 million articles uh, found that about one third uh, of the, the, the lies the misinformation uh, about the pandemic in the entire English speaking world uh, had something to do uh, with Trump. He is the mother load, not only of bullshit, but of misrepresenting uh, what's going on in the world. He's also a genius at the use of iconic images. So top left, some of you will remember this from the 2016 presidential campaign. It was only up for about an hour. This is a Jewish star. Red, of course, is communist and most corrupt candidate ever. Accuse the other side of that, which you are guilty. 
But in this one iconic image, you've got misogyny, you've got anti-Semitism, you've got uh, the, the common stereotypic trope of Jews being the ones who run the world. You can see the money in the background. People objected. Trump's people said, oh, we had no idea this is a Jewish star. Fucking nonsense, of course. And then they replaced it with a circle, but the damage was done. Millions of people saw it and you can still find it uh, if you want. All right, let's just keep going somewhat quickly. Uh, and the point that I would like to make is that all of Trump's gyrations, which are solely uh, to maintain power, never has Trump shown any actual concern uh, for the people that he purported to serve. But my point is that this has had catastrophic effects on the world in which we reside, those of us that are, are here in the United States. For one thing, uh, this was a study done in 2020 uh, based on 15 million participants. And, and uh, what they found is that more than any other factor, what determined physical distancing uh, was political partisan differences. Uh, and that basically uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, and particularly as things, uh, when we got the stay at home order, uh, basically uh, people who followed President Trump ignored the orders to distance. This was particularly true for people who watch Fox News. Uh, and this in turn, uh, caused higher rates of infection and death in pro-Trump counties. In other words, President Trump or former President Trump lied and, and shit tons of people died. In a more recent study, uh, this effect was found to still be true. So as of 2022, uh, in September, uh, much higher death rates from the pandemic uh, amongst Republicans than uh, amongst Democrats. Now, you might say, well, that's all right. Let them die. I don't uh, I don't care about them. Uh, I, I'm tended, I, sometimes I'm sympathetic to that view, uh, but mostly not. These are humans also. Uh, and the bottom line is, is that them dying affects us also. Uh, the unwillingness of too many Americans to be vaccinated has perpetuated the pandemic uh, much more than it might have been otherwise, et, et cetera. What we also know uh, is that we are an uglier and meaner uh, and much more racist uh, and, um, and, and xenophobic uh, country than we were when Trump uh, took office. Uh, base, and now uh, there's good news and bad news because basically Trump supporters ha have become much more prejudiced. They are more racist. They are more anti Islam. They are more anti Semitic. And to any of my Jewish friends out there that have any sympathy for Trump on the grounds that he has any concern about Israel, I think that you are frankly quite deluded, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, uh, the bad news is Trump supporters are much more prejudiced than they used to be. The good news is that uh, people who oppose Trump uh, have become much less prejudiced. If we had time to talk about this, I would hypothesize that one good thing about the pandemic it is that death anxiety amongst people who think of themselves as liberal or progressive, that might have been the psychological impetus for us to get off the proverbial bench and begin to do something to address these problems. And so when George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota during the pandemic, I, I think that a lot of the uh, justified outrage was a result uh, of the lingering uh, death anxiety. But that, let's talk about that another time. Uh, here's another scary study. Turns out, not surprisingly, that uh, Republicans and Democrats disagree uh, about the appropriateness of using violence, either to kill people abroad that we don't like or to kill people domestically uh, that we do not like. About a third of people who identify as Republicans in recent polls 
uh, they support uh, violence uh, in order to, quote, uh, save our country. And those sentiments, and here's the psychological point, are more pronounced amongst people who endorse the statement, I am one uh, with Donald Trump. And so this gets back to, it's called identity fusion. There are about a third of the people in America that are in a lobotomized mind meld uh, with former President Trump uh, who are quite willing to break out the guns uh, and give us another civil war uh, in order to uh, essentially assuage their own existential anxieties. All right, got about three minutes, so let me talk and then shut up. And that's to just say, well, I don't think it's overly hysterical to propose that we're at a crossroads uh, of some sort. Uh, and some of us have talked about this before, but I always like reading this little passage. Crises there will continue to be. In meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there's a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. But each proposal must be weighed in the light of a broader consideration, the need to maintain balance in and among national programs, balance between the private and public economy, balance between cost and hope for advantage. Another factor in maintaining balance involves the element of time. As we peer into society's future, you and I, we, and our government must avoid the impulse to live only for today, plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come, not to become the insolvent phantom of tomorrow. Down the long line of lane of history yet to be written, America knows that this world of ours ever growing smaller must avoid becoming a community of dreadful fear and hate and be instead a proud confederation of mutual trust and respect. Ditto. If I were to say what I think we should be thinking about right now, it would be this. And of course, I don't think we're anywhere near. We're actually uh, becoming a community of dreadful fear and hate uh, rather than trust and respect. Anyway, my point, if we were alive, I'd ask you who said that. I'd give you a dollar if anybody knew, uh, because it wasn't Martin Luther King or, or Jimmy Carter or Abraham Lincoln or Obama. It was former president and army general and Republican Dwight Eisenhower. And, and, my, and this is my point, which is that this is not about politics. This is about democracy. Uh, writ large. And I would submit that across the political spectrum, uh, that everything that I have said today should not be factually uh, disagreeable. All right. One more point, and then I will shut up. And, uh, and that's that I hope everybody uh, will look at uh, Robert Reich's book, Resurrecting Truth, where Reich in the last chapter um, uh, points out where we ought to go. My point is I started this tirade saying that lying and untruth is a big part of fascism. Well, if that's true, uh, then, uh, then let's skip back to the truth. And I like when Reich says we mustn't normalize public lying. Uh, let's do that. And then I like it when he says that we must also ensure that every American has sufficient education to differentiate truth from falsehood. Uh, and let's do that also. So some of you know, when I got here in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president. And I like Frank Zappa's reaction. Americans treat intelligent behavior as if it were some kind of hideous physical deformity. I think that's still where we're at, but I hope that it's not. Uh, I know we don't need to be that way. And it is my sincere hope that we move in a direction uh, that does resurrect the truth. All right. Thanks for listening. Those of you that still are, uh, we'll switch to questions uh, in a minute. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Sheldon. You always give us so much to think about. And I think this is definitely going to be one that folks are going to be coming back and watching the recording and, and just to absorb all of the information that you've shared with us. We have pages of questions coming in. And so we're going to try to get to as many as possible. Our first question is, can you qualify the massive appeal of a extremism in today's society as well as the willingness of society to overlook the obvious and detrimental impact of racism, classism, and sexism on our society's inability to thrive successfully? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, whoever uh, uh, offered that question, I would just say uh, yes. I, I think... And again, I wish we had more time because if I get to come back, I, I want to do something uh, about the wake and woke stuff because Governor DeSantis in Florida, who's a more dangerous fascist than Trump, but let's talk about that another time. You know, he's got the wake but not woke law. And remember what I said about fascists. They try and keep their people awake but only on that, that fast way of thinking about things, but not woke, because being woke, by definition, and even DeSantis defines it this way, to be woke is to recognize the structural inequalities uh, that need to be addressed if we are ever to thrive successfully as a culture. So that would be my response to that. All right. Well, I'm, I'm taking notes that we're going to sign you up for another webinar. I'm, yeah. And also just to talk to folks out there, you know how to find me. Uh, we'll get to questions and uh, and then maybe you, Carissa can send me a boatload of them. I'm happy to respond, but also don't be bashful. Let's keep this conversation going next. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll put your um, email address back up at the end here, too. Yeah. So question two, you spend a great deal of time speaking about Trump supporters and their views. Have you spoken directly to Trump supporters to ask them about their views and why they believe what they do? Or are you relying on the representations of those views as presented by others through their own filter? Yeah, great point. Uh, to be honest, both. Um, uh, to be silly, but uh, come to Saratoga. Uh, we are a white and Republican town, at least Stefanik is the biggest female Nazi in America, and she's one county over. I am surrounded by Trump supporters. They are my neighbors. They are fine humans. Uh, and um, I do try to talk to them. But what I, but what I have discovered is much along the lines of, of what Hoffer proposes, is that for a militant Trump supporter, it is almost impossible to have a conversation that involves the rational exchange of information. And I, I, I frankly, when people say, well, what are we going to do about this? I honestly don't know. I, I think that there's about a third of the people in America that are impervious to truth. They are impervious to reason. You know, remember, Trump said two days ago, uh, it's time to dispose of the Constitution. And then the next day he said that he didn't say it. It doesn't matter. The people who are supporting him uh, refuse to acknowledge the uh, uh, or anything else that he has done. So anyway, but, but my point is, though, that uh, sometimes, though, I have made uh, some inroads. But I believe that that takes a lot of time and respectful engagement such that uh, the people who support Trump are unable to deflect whatever one says uh, as patronizing condescension by the so-called educated elite. Some of you guys know this, but my first talk about this stuff uh, was in the early 2000s. I went to Wasilla, Alaska. And this was a week or two after a woman named Sarah Palin was elected governor. And some of you may remember her. She's an aspiring fascist also. And my point is, is these were all uh, Republicans. And at the beginning of the conversation, I just asked them to please let me 
make my points. Uh, and even though they looked like they wanted to charge the stage and tear my heart out of my chest and show it to me while it was still beating before I died, uh, there were some who, who said, you know what? Uh, you actually have a point, dude. Um, but most of my Republican friends that I agree to disagree with about lots of policies, uh, they, they are they basically want nothing to do with Trump. In other words, I do think it's important to note that he is not a conservative. He has nothing to do uh, with traditional Republican beliefs, per se. All right. Let me just stop there. But that's my view. I, I do think it is important that we all be willing to engage with our fellow Americans. And let's do it the way that Lincoln said, which is we must all be friends. The key here is to reestablish connection with our fellow Americans by identifying ourselves as fundamentally connected. This is a story for another time, but Trump's worst crime, in my opinion, was that he's never stopped running for president. In other words, he announced that he was going to run for re-election before he was inaugurated the first time. And then his speech, his inauguration speech, watch it. It's Hitler incarnate. It was divisive. It was dark. It was us against them. And that's not a good way to unite people and overcome their political differences. Great. Thank you. Question number three, I would like to know about the myth creation that goes hand in hand with the lying. It's not merely lying for lying's sake and diverting attention from truth. How is the world building of the myth of the ethnocentric nation part of the intellectual lobotomy of the propaganda? Yeah, again, that's one of these. Maybe I'm getting tired and being a little silly. But that's a perfect statement of what goes on. In, in other words, not all worldviews uh, are, 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 are blatant misrepresentation uh, of reality. There are plenty of worldviews that do not require the intellectual lobotomy. So the, the point that Hoffer would make and that I subscribe to is that it, it's only the fascist types uh, that uh, need to create a worldview that is so radically discrepant from reality uh, that in order to maintain it, uh, you need to use propaganda. Great. Question number four. I am interested in the concept of the closed system that Arthur Kostler wrote about and how that is employed by both the right and the left to invalidate criticism and questioning and to legitimize their own position. Do you see this as part of the strategy employed here? Well, I mean, this is a compliment, but are you guys all like PhDs or something? These are like the kinds of questions I'm like, oh, if I could answer that, I'd be chugging rum out of a coconut with my Nobel Prize. I love Coastler. I like the closed system idea. Uh, so again, I'm being silly. Yes, I see that as part of the strategy, but I do feel very strongly, and at the and I I have uh, disagreements with my closest colleagues about this. Uh, I, I don't like uh, any intimation of equivalence on the left and right. In other words, if we're going to talk about the left as like Putin and Russia, yeah, he's a fucking monster, just like our monsters here on the right. Uh, but th there is th there's no symmetry between left and right in terms of criticism uh, and questioning. And, and this is just a statement of fact. The Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Southern California, it just shows if you lean to the right and you get your news from Fox News, it's 80 percent wrong. If you lean to the left, it's 20 percent wrong. Uh, I, I just think there's a whole lot of asymmetry in terms of the volume of uh, beliefs that are illegitimate. Uh, yeah, we all have confirmation biases and we all tend to uh, to resist uh, criticism. 
And that's one of the things that we're all going to have to get better at. Uh, Just coming back to something I said briefly earlier, democracy is in big trouble because we have forgotten both our rights as well as our obligations as democratic citizens. That's why Thomas Jefferson started the University of Virginia. He understood that morons and uneducated people are dangerous for democracy. They also understood that democracy collapses if we all agree that it's really about civil disagreement, that every one of us as citizens has an obligation uh, to to come to our own conclusions about what we think is right. Uh, And that's the argument is that what makes democracy best is that it is ultimately the collective cogitation uh, of a large body uh, of right-minded citizens, right-minded in the sense of being devoted to truth and justice rather than devotion to an ideological demagogue. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what type of foundational, emotional, psychological skills can we utilize to help loved ones, clients, et cetera, who are susceptible to being lobotomized? Yeah, again, get back to me when you know that. That is the $10,000 question. There's a political scientist at the University of California, Irvine. His name's Sean Rosenberg. Uh, And I can't remember. I'm going to fuck it up. But he wrote a paper recently. In fact, it hasn't been published yet. So I'll send it to anybody that wants to see it. Uh, And that that's what his paper is about. He, He said, Uh, that he does not believe that Americans right now have the emotional or intellectual skills uh, to be, first of all, just have a state of psychological well-being, but to also be citizens in a functional democracy. And and so what Rosenberg says, he's like, wow, uh, is this about capability or is it about context? Is Is it that we're incapable Uh, of actually being citizens in a civil democracy uh, who are uh, educationally uh, to the point where we're emotionally and intellectually intact? Or is it just that we lack the proper context? And and for me, uh, I think it has a lot to do with context. I'm going to go out on a, I think education is a big part. Like I say, most Americans, they can't They know nothing about the American government or how it's structured. Most Americans right now are too anxious and insecure uh, to uh, have the skills to step back and 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 think about things. So, yeah, that's where I'm going on that one. All right. These, we've got um, a twofer for our final question here, and we'll give you some time as well if you want to kind of provide any last um, or final thoughts here as well. But um, our last question here is, what gives you hope and where do we go from here? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what gives me hope is that, um, uh, is that uh, you know, it's like, wow, uh, People can be annoying, <laughs> and um, and at at some in some places it's like wow, you know, uh, Ernest Becker, the guy that my work is based on, he said in his last book, I don't even know if humans are a viable form of life. And when I read that, I took off for a year. I was so demoralized. But what gives me hope is the fact that at our best, humans have a great track record uh, at uh, basically. Um, uh, uh, confronting uh, and successfully adjusting to major challenges when we figure out uh, what's going on. So the example I use all the time is the plague in the Middle Ages. It killed half the people in Europe because we thought it was caused by evil spirits, right? And then we figured out that it was caused by germs uh, and Uh, And that was gave us some uh, way of thinking about things that enabled us to respond effectively. My point these days uh, and um, yeah, here I don't mind uh, using the PC language is like we need to be both awake and woke. Uh, My my plea uh, is to do something. The only thing that we can't do is nothing. I don't think there is any one way to proceed, 
um, except to propose that anybody out there, if you slept in a bed last night and if you had something to eat today, uh, then A, you should be grateful and, and B, you should be doing something. And I don't, I don't know uh, what that is. It could be doing anything, uh, but it should at least in my mind uh, include thinking about these things and acting on them directly. How about starting uh, by voting? Like I tell the youth, there's not enough old, ignorant, white dudes spraying cheese whiz on a cracker in the trailer park in Michigan uh, to keep fascism going um, if you were to vote. And so uh, young people, why not start uh, by uh, getting involved? So to me, that would be a start. But that's not enough. I liked Obama's speech in Georgia the other day when he's like, don't just do something on Election Day. Uh, why don't we do something uh, every day? Uh, and even if that includes just being a decent uh, and kind person as you engage with folks around you that might not share your view of the world, that would be a good thing. And how about if you're not busy? Why not step up? I, I'm, I'm saying this, looking at myself, hoping that I might do it someday. Hey, I, let's get involved uh, in politics. Uh, uh, let's not have the only people running for office to be uh, like high school dropouts, like who's that, Lauren, uh, the Colorado lunatic. I call her Loretta Bobber, but uh, Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, the idiot with the machine gun. Those people are running for office and winning, uh, Saratoga has been taken over uh, by Nazis on the school board. And if you don't watch what's happening in your community, uh, that's what you will be confronting in the near future. Those of you that might live in Florida or, or Tennessee or Texas, uh, pay attention. Uh, it is no longer legal to say things that happen to be true uh, in any of those states. So my point is like, do something. Uh, and, and these are challenging times, uh, but I like the people who argue for, at the same time, uh, sincere and dedicated engagement uh, while not being naive to the prospect of the horrors that might befall us to still at the same time uh, be joyous and grateful for the fact that we're all alive. Yeah. That's a wonderful note to wrap up on, and you know, especially at this time of year. So, um, I do you have anything else that you want to offer? Just kind uh, of well, closing? yes, yes, and no. Just thank you, everybody. Uh, blast me a message. Uh, come see us, and um, yeah, and that, that's it. That was great. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so thank you so much um, for your time today. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. Um, and really just, uh, we hope that everyone has gotten a lot out of this. The recording will be, um, coming imminently and, um, thank you again to all of you for tuning in and submitting your questions and please stay safe, stay well, be well, be kind and happy holidays and good luck Sheldon with the remainder of the semester for sure. Thank you. Thank you.